Well, welcome to the Common Sense Show, and I am excited because I have a guest here, and we're talking about investing today. Chris Vermulin, don't call him Vermulian because he doesn't like that. Well, I don't know if he doesn't like that, but we'll find <laughs> out when we come on stage in a minute. But um, Chris is a financial expert who challenges conventional investing wisdom, and we're going to get into that today. We're going to talk a lot about it. I'm going to excavate some of his thoughts on investing um, and why he believes his approach is something that is sustainable. So I'm looking forward to bringing him on. Without further ado, I'm going to let him introduce himself like I let all my guests introduce themselves because it just sounds better coming from them. They're the ones who live the life, right? So we're, we're going to welcome Chris to the platform or to the to the show. Chris, welcome to the Common Sense Show. How you doing, bud? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. So you are quite the unconventional guy when it comes to investing. And if we have folks who are watching this uh, live interview and they are trying to figure out what in the world kind of style of investing you have, I'd like you to just introduce yourself and and let. why don't you give us some uh, first order principles um, that you have for investing and then we'll go from there. Sure. Well, well high level, I'm a, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an inventor, I'm an investor. And um, I have naturally gravitated towards the stock market. I have traded all the different asset classes and styles of investment vehicles from small cap stocks, fundamental trading, options, futures, currencies, uh, day trading, scalping, you name it. I've, I've kind of done them all over the years. I've been doing this for uh, over 25 years. And uh, I found my, my style, the way that I read the markets, the way that's comfortable and works for me uh, through ETFs, investing in ETFs and moving from one asset class to another, which maybe you and I will touch on here, uh, I don't believe in diversification in terms of what most people do and how they see and, and, and execute on diversification. I think diversification is a great way to underperform, take a lot of risk. And I, I do all this by navigating the markets using technical care about news, the Fed, earnings, all that stuff is pretty useless when it comes to investors, in my opinion, as uh, I'll explain later on. But um, uh, yeah, I just I see the markets from a very different angle that uh, makes the financial industry and advisors, you know, kind of squirm in their seats, I think, because it makes them look like it's not designed for the investor. It's not good for the for the end user who literally puts their money into the markets to try to grow it. Uh, most people are having a lot higher risk levels than they ever thought possible uh, in, in their buy and hold or their trading styles. So we'll, we'll kind of dig deep into that, I think. Awesome. That sounds good. Before we get into that, I just want to uh, make a declarative statement because my lawyer would be remiss if I didn't, that everything that you hear today is not financial advice. <laughs> <laughs> if you are interested in any of the techniques that are spoken about today, this is for education purposes only. So you can consult with an investment professional or a financial advisor and um, for your specific situation. So this is education only. Don't say that you heard it here. And we gave you the advice <laughs> to do anything that Chris is saying. He's a professional. All right. So let's talk about this because I have an affinity for ETFs myself. I own quite a few. Um, mm -hmm. I think ETFs are God's gift to um, to investing and trading. Um, and they make, an, in my opinion, an amazing, an amazing addition to an IRA. If you have an IRA and you're using that cash to to you know as a retirement growth vehicle for growing money but let's talk about diversification because warren buffett and charlie munger also have uh thoughts about the term diversification and what that means tell mm -hmm. me why you i wouldn't say chafe and maybe you do chafe at the at the term diversification why do you naturally think diversification is i don't know a farce maybe that's strong but not as strong a, a useful tool as other people think yeah, so I think diversification is vital to survival and to consistent growth. But a lot of people see or think diversification is something uh, that I don't think is right. So, for example, uh, people will buy a lot of stocks or ETFs and they'll have their portfolio diversified with, you know, ETFs or stocks in all kinds of different sectors. Could be technology, could be biotech, could be whatever, retail or banks. And people are like, well, I'm nice and diversified. I'm good. Uh to me, the stock market, it doesn't matter what stock or sector you own, stocks in general is one investment. It's one asset class. When it, Just think of, um, 
I was trying to explain the stock market is like the ocean. When the tide is going up, it lifts all boats. When the tide is going down, pretty much all boats go down as well. The stock market is the same. When we're in a bull market, almost everything goes up. When we're in a bear market, almost everything goes down. So it doesn't matter if you own every you know sector in the stock market. They're pretty much all going to be going down at the same time. So there's a time to be invested in stocks and own it as an asset when it's going up or benefiting from it going down. And there's a time when you, you should move to a different asset class. Real estate is another one. Bonds are another asset. Um, currencies and commodities are a different asset. So this is the, the big problem is people are like, well, I've got a diversified portfolio. I've got stocks and bonds. And really all you have is two assets. And uh, they can both go down together, as we saw last year, where the buy and hold portfolio got slaughtered. And the people who thought they had lots of bonds and had a very low risk portfolio got taken up behind the woodshed and hacked into pieces because bonds are down like 50 percent. And, yeah. you know, it just goes to show you can't just have two assets and you like it's and you have to be able to move and change when a trend changes. You have to step aside or take advantage of the new trend. You don't just turn a blind eye and hold it because it worked you know, over the last 40 years with falling interest rates. Uh, if rates are going up, bonds go down. I mean, anybody who is left holding bonds obviously doesn't actually have their money being managed. It's just parked there and you're just paying fees to really ride a roller coaster. And uh, the older you are, the later stages you are, the more risk you are uh, with the buy and hold. It becomes very, very dangerous. And, um, and, you know, my whole style is I don't believe in holding an asset if it's going down or sideways. Right. We just move aside. We move to an asset that's going up. And if you do that, then you're not, you know, you don't have these big losses. And if you don't have big losses, you're not always hunting for the next big trade. You're not swinging for the fences. Instead, all you need is a bunch of first, second, third base hits over and over again. And your account just consistently keeps growing. So that is where I focus on is. I don't mind taking a loss. I don't mind getting out before something gets bad and I can buy it back later, either at a better price or even at a higher price. But I don't want to hold it if it's going down because the reality is if the trend, whatever trend is in place is more likely to continue. If it is trending down, you're best just to you know step aside and move to something that is going up. So would some people just say that you're impatient and you in that um, you're trying to, uh, in some ways, like like you're cutting your nose off to spite your face because of of the you not wanting to deal with the timing, the market. It, was, is that something that critics would kind of say about that approach? Yeah, critics will say you can't time the market. If anybody says it's steer clear, uh, people will say technical analysis is voodoo. Um, I will say throwing your money in the market and doing absolutely nothing but letting fate go over is this zero skills, zero, <laughs> zero, anything. I mean, there's no risk. I'm sorry. There, I mean, it's all risk. You're guaranteed to have a roller coaster ride. Right. Um, but yeah, the critics will say you can't time the market. And I'm not so much about, I don't like the word timing because, because of that people say, Oh, you know, people, there's right. market timers. Right. Um, what I do is I follow trends. We can tell if something is going up or down and right. if it's, you know, it's not moving up, it doesn't matter what type of investor you are. You want your investments to go up in value. So if it's right. not going up, you might as well step aside. But people fall in love with an asset class and um, and they don't want to get out of it. And that's that's the problem is, you know, you have to be able to move away from something, even if you like it, if it's not working out. And so um, in that case, what is your what is your opinion on on value investing? Um and, you know, obviously that's gotten a buzzword and we know that it's worked very well for, obviously, for Berkshire um, and their stockholders and some other investors. Mm -hmm. Of course, people also discredit uh, Warren Buffett by saying that it, he also was value investing in 19, you know, 45. <laughs> and so yeah. if, if it, anybody would have had similar returns, um, I think that's kind of, you know, neither here nor there given that. You still have to have some insight because he's also proven that he's been able to build billions of dollars of wealth um, in modern times. But um, how do you how do you see value investing kind of fitting into it? Kind of, it doesn't your method doesn't completely exclude value investing, but it, it doesn't include a lot of the elements as well. Right. So. so I do a lot of different styles of investing, and there's different cycles and stages. So for example. 
I don't really think there is value investing right now. I think every, most investments are overvalued, including real estate and stocks. I think value investing is phenomenal, but we need there to be a value investment to move into. So for example, I believe, um, you know, over the next couple of years, we're going to have very difficult economic times. I think the stock market could go through a financial reset. Real estate, I think, is going to have a financial reset. Uh, I actually offer an infographic, uh, you know, on my website that talks about these stages of when things are overvalued and fair valued or undervalued and where we are in these stages. Right. So I think uh, of value investing is phenomenal. In fact, it's the most exciting thing I keep telling everybody. Uh, you know, to be looking forward to it, because if we do have this financial reset, we're going to not only be able to buy real estate, that's going to be fairly valued or undervalued, but stocks that are paying good dividends, we can move into all kinds of great assets that are a value play. But right now, I still think we're paying nose bleeding prices for almost every asset out there. Um, and we just have to wait for the value play to come into effect. So when I when I look at that, you know, if we have a major bear market, um, and we see a reevaluation event, these, to me, a valuation play only happens after a financial reset, a bear market. That's the kind of value I look for, like real value, broad market value. And then we can move in and you can dump money into the market when you're buying it at a very low price that has um, got lots of upside potential. But buying anything right now, I still feel as though it's just not a value play. So we have to be a little more active to make sure we don't hold it if it falls. But if it keeps going up, we want to be into it. It certainly seems like the bond market is headed for the slaughterhouse um, <laughs> here in the in the near term. Um, how do you how do you assess value, um, and do you look at financials of the firm? You said you don't look at price, but do you look at financials? Do you look at the management team? You said you don't look at news. What kind of analysis do you undertake to be able to gauge value? Right. So a uh, long story short is I used to trade small cap stocks. When I started out, I used to be a fundamental. I always looked at their earnings and all that stuff. And then the 2000 tech bubble hit. And even companies I was, I was buying that were actually having uh, growing quarters, their stock prices were still getting cut in half. And I lost a lot of money buying companies that had good fundamentals just because the tide was going down and it pulled everything down with it. Uh, so I think it was oh, 2001, I pretty much dumped fundamental analysis. I really, I don't listen to the news. I've gone on, I'm, I'm going on 10 years now that I haven't listened to the news. My, my 11 year old and 13 year old kid will tell me if there's breaking news. Um, I don't read other people's opinions because I have my own way of doing things and I don't need to get the lines blurred and, and uh, be confused. Uh, I am purely a technical analyst. So you know, if you ask anybody, what do you want your investment to do? They're going to say, I want it to go up in value. And so all I do is I follow price. I look for things going up or we actually look to profit from things that are collapsing. If if there's a bad enough scenario, we can we can play inverse ETFs or we can buy uh, certain assets that'll go up if other assets are going down. So uh, you won't ever see me talking about the news, the media, fundamental data. I, I feel as though it's very useless uh, tool. And it, it's always, even if it is you, powerful, it's always delayed. Like it's not going to be the same as a price chart. Good news can come out and the stock can fall. And, uh, you know, it's just not a timing tool. Although I hate to use that word timing. <laughs> of course. Well, and, and, and like, you know, thinking about this critically, obviously one of the biggest issues surrounding, um, you know, buying using, you know, price value and jumping in at that point is that, and, well, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing, but like, you know, you can't predict the bottom, right? Every Everyone tries to predict the bottom when, mm -hmm. when prices are going to bottom out and then buy then. And which means that almost everyone who tries to predict the bottom on CNBC and other places are almost always wrong because, <laughs> you know, which is goes to your point about not watching the news. But compared to what you used to, the fundamental analysis that you used to undertake to to purchase a stock, do you miss the mark of the bottom by any significant portion now compared to uh, previous previous times where you've entered into buying these assets? Yeah. So if you're a trend follower, you're looking for trends and you have systems in place, like things, the charts need to meet criteria. You've got all these rules in place. Um, you're never going to get in at the bottom. You're, you're never going to get out at the top. You're really, you have to let an asset bottom and start to rally. 
And then once that trend's been in place long enough, there's enough underlying technicals and intermarket analysis because everything in the markets are connected. If one asset class is going up, that means another one is going down. Money is flowing out of something and going into something else. So we, I look at a lot of different things to identify, you know, not only is price moving up, but we need to make sure other assets, sectors, commodities, and asset classes are favoring saying like people are moving into risk on plays or risk off plays. Um, and so we do get in much later than the bottom. We get out well after it's it's topped out. And all we're looking is for that middle section. We're just trying to catch that initial, that, that middle safe part of the rally. And the stronger a bottom, so if it has a V-shaped bottom, uh, those make it so you actually get in a lot later, um, unfortunately, just because price action, you know, that happens to go straight up and straight down again or vice versa. Uh, it's not time. It takes time to create a trend that's proven. Uh, so, you know, V-shaped recoveries and drops and pops are very difficult to to be able to get in and out of at a good time. But that's the nice thing is the, the market is generally trending. And if you can avoid the chop and avoid the corrections, you know, once you hop into a trend, you can catch that nice middle section kind of of that trade and, and play that. It's if you think you can catch bottoms or you think you want to uh, or you should be able to. I mean, it's not the reality. And unfortunately, a lot of people will try to pick a bottom and they happen to fluke out and catch one. And then they think for some reason that they've got it figured out. And I think catching, picking a bottom and, or, or picking a top and nailing it is the worst thing anyone can do because now you have this false sense of, you know, when something's topping and you think with, you know, when to get in. And uh, it's a very dangerous time because some of the strongest moves happen in the last like 10% of a trend. So right when you go to pick the bottom, if it just the bottom drops out even further and people just take so much pain so quickly and then they have to have to get out or the same with somebody who shorts the market and it, it goes up without them and has a huge move right at the end of a trend. Um, and so that the market is great at getting people very emotional. It's the number one thing the market can do is get in your head, and make you do something really stupid. <laughs> right. So how do you value or do you value at all? historical analysis as a part of your strategy or do or do you just see do you see that as a fundamental uh flaw in trading as well i think historical data is very powerful it's it's nice to know how things have moved in the past um uh, relationships with other asset classes uh i mean you know price charts really are just human emotions are they greedy are they you know fearful um is there not much interest in something we can we can see that in the charts uh, and, and that's what really moves stock prices, just people's emotions. So when right. you look back on the charts, it's just, you know, the, the fear among the masses, like the stock market is just a giant school of fish and they, they tend to just move in big waves. And, um, I think historical data is very important because you, you really want to look back on an asset and be like, how volatile is this particular asset? Um, and, and. Um, what are the typical ranges that it moves before it has some type of correction or how, how much does it fall on average during you know, certain stages? So I like to look at all this stuff because when I invest into um, ETFs and we move through our strategy, through our hierarchy of assets, you know, our most volatile assets at the top, which is like the stock market. And we, yep. we generally want to own the most volatile asset because when it's trending, it can generate the most returns. But as the markets get unstable, we start moving down our asset hierarchy to bonds or to a, a currency or to like a cash interest earning account. Um, we move away from volatility, which is the opposite of what most people do. As soon as we start getting volatility, that means people are emotional. They're trying to pick bottoms. They start to jump into options and leveraged ETFs. I mean, people do the exact opposite of what you should do when volatility kicks in. If for some reason, they start swinging for the fences and trying to take advantage of it, where I do the opposite. We start trimming back and move to slower and slower moving assets. Currencies are an awesome asset you can get into. They're slow moving. They trend really nicely. You can squeeze out an extra percent or two here and there while the stock market is in chaos mode. And uh, you can kind of skirt the, the noise and be able to squeeze a little bit more money out of the market with very, very little risk. Uh, and so that's what we do is we'll move from one asset class like the stock market to a currency play and um, and then back again. And, and however the markets move, we just kind of reinvest our capital into different assets. So with so much with 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 a higher level of frequency trading that you do in a short period of time, do you essentially 
cap your capital gains, um, like which you could actually end up making? Have you noticed any trends in what how much money you leave on the table by moving in and out so frequently? Yeah, so I wouldn't say we're a high frequency because that can definitely give people some. So we have about <laughs> five to 12 trades a year. So okay. we're definitely not high frequency. Now, if you're an active trader, you'll be like, oh, that's not enough trades because traders for some reason think they need to trade a lot to make more, which isn't mm -hmm. true. Uh, a passive investor with an advisor will be like five to 12 trades. That's a ton of trades. So we're like stuck in this no man's land in the middle where it's like not enough for the active trader and it's way too active for somebody who doesn't you know, manage their accounts at all. Um, so that's that's probably one of the reasons why it works so well is the stock market right. moves in the areas that no one's at <laughs> uh, in terms of kind of uh, cycles and, and things like that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I like to look at the stock market just like, as I said, the ocean. And so what I focus on is if you're walking down a beach in Florida or anywhere down a coastline and there's waves, you'll see surfers you know, floating out on the horizon. And what are they doing? They're sitting out there waiting for a clean set of waves to roll in. And so that's what I do. We sit back. We can see when a fresh new set of waves of assets with momentum behind them are coming through the market and we can pick the one we want, hop on that wave, ride it. And because it stands out above everything else and it's got clear technicals and strength behind it, we also know exactly when it's starting to fade off and when we need to cut out of that wave and let the thing just crash. Uh, so that is what we do is we float out there. We're patient. Uh, we actually sit in cash about 30 to 40 percent of the time in the year of the year, uh, just collecting interest on the sidelines while we wait for these five to 12 trades. And these trades might only last a couple of weeks. They could last eight months. It really depends the market, how the market is moving, but that's how, that's how I look at the markets. That's how I kind of attack them is, uh, let the trades stand out and come to us. We'll ride that wave and then we'll get out of it when it starts to uh, fizzle out. So, do you believe that what we're being told about investing is wrong? Hundred percent. I, I so I think there's 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 two sides of the equation. So everybody does one of these or both of them, and that is mm -hmm. either you're a passive investor, you do nothing, you just park your money and ride that roller coaster. There's a reason why passive investors with the buy and hold never retire twenty or thirty years younger, uh, mm -hmm. sooner. Like they're they're taking the long way to get there. If you do nothing, you can still get there, but it's going to be a rough ride. It's going to take forever. Uh, the other side is the active traders. There's numerous studies across North America, Taiwan, Brazil. They show that an active trader who's traded for 300 days or more, even during a bull market, 97% of them lost money. The more you trade, the more likely you are to lose. The more you trade, the more emotional you are, which is one of the core reasons why people lose. The other thing is people don't know how to manage trades or risk. They have no idea position size to go in. They always pick a random number. I'm going to buy 500 shares or $20,000 of this stock or whatever it is. They don't actually have a rhyme or reason. And um, it, it just makes it a nightmare. The active trading, I mean, I've done it my entire life. I started when I was uh, in 1997 in high school. Um, I live and breathe this. And the reality is if you are not going to dedicate your life to the markets and live and breathe it every day and always be open to learning and adjusting, you're really probably never going to make it. Like this isn't something you just go and, and do on the, on the side very well. It is the markets are finely tuned. They will get into your head. They will find a way to pull your money from you. Um, if you're young, the buy and hold is fine. Um, but if you're, you know, in your later stages, we could go into, you know, a huge correction, something similar to the 2000 tech bubble, where it took 12 years for the SP 500 to come back, 16 years for the NASDAQ. Uh, we're talking 50 to, you know, 70% market correction. If you are close to retirement or retired, this, that's the last thing you want. Uh, and the buy and hold is going to make sure you're going to have all that time wasted with no returns. You're going to have tons of financial stress. And uh, we can always make money back as an investor, but you can't make back time. So I would say I'm impatient in terms of, I don't want to waste time. If we can just move out of this one particular asset that's starting to go down and go move into something else and just keep making more money and just by leapfrogging onto a different asset, you know, each month or every couple of months, I'd much rather just see my account keep going up than holding on to it and riding something out and going through the financial crisis and, and the stress that comes with it. So um, I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, but <laughs> yeah, no. And of course it, it kind of spurred on more questions, which is like, okay, well, let's 
you know, I take your point. So like, you know, you got interested in this, interested in this in high school, um, which is how, how in the world did you get interested in this in high school? Because what kid in high school is actually interested in this? Um, and what, what made you want to pursue this um, as a way to, to make money? And did you initially start the premise with buying and holding in high school? And if so, when did you decide to switch value sets? Yeah, good questions. Okay, so I'll, I'll try and not keep it too long here, but uh, it was, I think it was grade 11 in high school, grade 12. We, I was in finance class and our, our, uh, our classroom had a stock market challenge. So our finance class, we have to, we have $100,000. We had to pick stocks and trade them throughout the semester to see if we could beat out other schools, other finance classes across the province. I'm up here in Canada. And um, we made like, you know, 80 something thousand dollars in that semester. And that was it. I was just like, that's what I want to do. I can just open a, you know, a newspaper, we can pick a stock and it just goes up in value. And so that was kind of how I initially got into the idea. I'm like, well, this is amazing. I'm, I'm from an entrepreneur family. So as soon as I saw how you could make money, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even have to talk to people. I open a newspaper, I pick a stock and I put some money in. So that kind of got me started in it. And it wasn't really uh, you know, a couple months later, my dad got a booklet, a little marketing booklet from Larry Williams. I don't know if you know who he is. He's like kind of a major futures trader. He's got, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tech futures. He's got his own indicators, Mm -hmm. uh, named after him, but he had this booklet on how to trade futures. And when I saw the leverage in futures and like, you know, making 20 or 50 K like in a few days, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Of course I was like, you know, 16 at the time. Uh, and I remember I asked my dad, I said, dad, let's open an account. Let's trade like Larry Williams has got this stuff. And my dad laughed at me. He's like, we're not trading futures. <laughs> and I, I didn't really know the leverage and the risk involved at the, with them back right. then. It, back then it was talking about pork bellies and all this stuff. And I was just oh, like, God, I yeah. don't care what it is. It's got money in it. Yeah, yeah, but, exactly. So that's what got me spurred into it. My dad says, well, just keep learning, you know, and as soon as I hit 18, I was off in college. I had saved up money and I told him, I said, my dad, I said, listen, I'm, I want to open an E-Trade account, but I need you to co-sign because I'm only 18. He co-signed on it for me. I put in a couple grand and uh, I ended up trading and I, I made thousands of dollars through college, which was amazing. I remember I bought Palm Pilot. Do you remember Palm Pilot, those little phones with the pen? Yeah, like, I had one, man. That yeah. Thing was amazing. I love it. Yeah. So I, I bought that, I that stock. And the trio. I, I had the trio. Yeah. So the trio was is was like my second favorite then my number one favorite was blackberry because i love the clack of the keys uh, yeah. yeah i never had a palm pilot but i thought it was brilliant so i owned the stock and it just took off and i like i went from a two thousand dollar account to like eighty five hundred dollar account wow. uh, over so i went away for christmas for two weeks to florida i just put everything in palm pilot and i went on holidays never even looked at it i came home and i was like rich <laughs> of course i was like 18. i was like right. this is unbelievable of uh, so that that's that got its hooks into me that was my big win that you know it backfires down the road if you have those big wins because mm-hmm. it's not that easy to make money normally right but uh long story short that's how i got into it i ended up writing a book called technical trading mastery after i moved to technical analysis after the, the tech bubble burst i wanted to just follow price. And I actually contacted Larry Williams and said, Larry, I've written a book. You got me into this sport, into this business. I like, I'd love you to write like a foreword or, or review it. And so he's on the back of my book. And uh, it was just amazing that he got me into it. And then I wrote a book, I've become successful in it. And, you know, he, uh, so it's just a, that was my whole kind of full circle of how I got in. And uh, yeah. So if a person is listening to you now, who's watching this show, they, they're likely a small business owner, or someone who's interested in the market, obviously, why else would they watch an episode about investing like this in this asset class? How do they even begin to formulate a plan that will work for them? How are they able to understand it? You talked about um, the issues around the statistic of trading 300 times or more. Um, I, you didn't say what time period. So, so, but it was over. Yeah, it was actually over a 300 day window. So just over okay. a year. Yeah. Okay. So essentially trading about once, almost once a day. Um, if you do that, you're, you're 97% likely to lose. So how does a person put together a plan for themselves with limited knowledge to be able to structure um, their ability to hone their, their sight, their vision for, yeah. for what you've been able to do? 
Yeah, I think, it, well, it's a process. It, it just goes to show how difficult this space is when you look at it that way. You know, I always talk about you need to know your personality type. And a lot of people um, don't realize this. So have, you've heard of the Myers-Briggs. Have you ever heard of the Myers-Briggs personality test? Yes, I'm an ENTJ. <laughs> nice. I'm an INTJ. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right on. So, a very similar coin. Yeah, exactly. So long story short is I, I actually talk about this in my book. Um, I, I wrote a, a big blog post on it. And so long story short is I think everybody needs to do a, the – Myers-Briggs test, find out what personality type they are, read how their brain perceives and, and, and manages things. Uh, and then you're going to have a good feeling of, of who you are and how your brain works and how you feel when certain things are happening. Uh, right. Because I, I did a study and I've found that out of the 18 personality types that there are, 16 of them uh, don't bode well for, um, or 13 of them, I think it is actually, I don't bode well for financial success. Meaning if you have one of these 13 personality types, yeah. then you're most likely going to fall victim to emotions and you're going to struggle financially to manage your own money. Mm -hmm. And you're probably going to have a lot of problems with self-discipline. And even if you're very disciplined in your own field, like there's a lot of very sharp, sophisticated people that move into the stock market and then they just get they just lose everything because right. the stock market isn't about how sharp you are. It's how much how you can control your emotions and put systems in place right. and, and follow rules and manage risk. It's, it's all about that. So if, if motions get into your head, you can lose all your self-discipline, which means you start skipping trades. You start, you don't get out when you're supposed to get out. There's nothing worse than watching a loser just keep getting worse and worse and, and hold on to it for years or until it hits a breaking point that you're like, I can't lose anymore. Or I have to get out. So uh, once you understand your personality type, then you're going to know if you have, especially if you have one of these 13 personalities, you're going to be like, okay, well, I am victim to struggling in this, this field. I need to find a service or somebody that can, that can help me. So for example, uh, if you're somebody kind of like you and I, we can be very focused and systemized and we can create systems and rules and, and follow them very well. We can kind of break apart the emotional side. Um, so we're pretty good on our own. But if you get into an emotional personality type, you need somebody to hold your hand. You need somebody to be like, okay, well, here are the trades. You just, all you have to do is execute these. But if you have troubles executing those trades because your emotions get in the way, you're like, well, I don't want to buy here. I think the market's still going lower, or I don't want to enter now because I think we already missed the run. If you can't pull the trigger when there's a new trigger, a new trade alert in the market uh, where the technicals are saying, hey, you have to do this because that's what the markets are saying we should be doing, uh, then you almost need it done for you. And sure. some people just need auto trading or, or an advisor to do it or, or something like that. So you need to figure out like, you know, are you having troubles pulling the trigger? Are you constantly frustrated? If you are, then you almost need like, you know, a strategy kind of done for you. And you need to find a strategy that isn't crazy active, chasing big returns, uh, isn't, you know, just sitting on the sidelines or, or doing nothing and just letting your money sit there. You need to find something that rides these market waves and protects you on, on the, on the pullbacks. It's, you know, I've done this for, you know, over 25 years and there's very few people out there that, that do it. Um, everybody has a great mousetrap. It sounds amazing. There's a million trading newsletters and alert services that say all kinds of great stuff. But the reality is it's a rotating door and uh, the strategies, you know, aren't there to just generate consistent returns and protect your capital. They're selling you on big returns. We're going to do lots of trades and uh, it's great for getting their money, <laughs> the subscriber's money, but it's not good for the subscriber. That's the reality of it. And I mean, I've seen hundreds of newsletters, you know, come in and go out of business. Just, you know, it's they're more of a marketing thing, which is really frustrating because they they put this false sense of reality of people thinking options and big returns and, you know, 50 percent return every year or more. I mean, right. that's not how the markets really work if you want to protect your capital and, and grow it. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Speaking about newsletters, I just want to take a quick second to say to all those who are watching today to uh, subscribe to my free newsletter. Um, it goes out weekly, and I in that newsletter I talk about business strategy. I well, really, the focus of the Common Sense Show is different ways to make money, earn generational wealth, become wealthy, to pass stuff on to your kids, and but to create ideas and to actually create long standing businesses that actually last for a long period of time. So join my uh, newsletter. Uh, it will be posted after the live. You can't do it now, but after the live is finished, 
um, there will be a link in there for you to, to, to join my weekly newsletter. So here's so here's a fundamental question though for you. Okay, I have cash, I have a job, or I have a business. I want to break into this because I'm all about implementation and, and being able to put things into place like today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. How do I make a transition from what I'm doing now to be able to become a self-sufficient investor who can slowly build? Like the loss is got to be, as you mentioned about the personality type, you have to be uh, – steal your balls essentially because it, it, it could be a hard ride but like how do you um make the transition if you're trying to go from a person with a nine to five um a person who is a small business owner who's about to sell it a person who for instance has just sold it like mm -hmm. how do you make this transition into this specific career path because it interests you which is like the, the number one thing that is probably relevant to getting into something is that it should interest you. How do you make this transition without killing yourself? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I'm all about passive income and systems and business, business things, right? I mean, I, I read a book many, many years ago. My dad gave it to me. He's like, read this book. It's called built to sell. It's by John Warlock. Sure. And it's all about, it's all about systemizing, taking whatever you do, systemize it. And then you actually have a business, a, right. a business, a machine that makes money with, or like without you is the plan. The mm -hmm. more it can work without you, the more money that business is worth and the mm -hmm. more of them you can then run because it doesn't need you. You can just go find the next one. So I've done very similar. I have multiple rental properties. I've built a self storage facility. They all run on their own. They generate passive income. Uh, I like to do a lot of different stuff. I invent products. I invent uh, some pretty, pretty interesting things. And, you know, as I kind of have gone through the trading world of being like a day trader and doing all that stuff, I like, you know, if you get too deep into trading, especially you get into day trading and being really active momentum trader, it's a, it's a bloody job. I mean, it's, it's not fun after a while. You're like, I have to find a trade today. I have to find some trades. You go down this dark path and it's, it's not fun. I mean, it sounds fun. Everybody wants to be a, a trader uh, right. and that's what everybody strives for. That's why they want to trade more and stuff because there's a rush to it. It's like, a, it, mm -hmm. I mean, it's highly addicting. Um, and, uh, but the reality is I have created a strategy and that, you could have kind of what I do, the way I trade ETFs, what I call asset revesting. I've created an auto traded strategy. So we don't, I don't manage money. I don't do any of that. But if you have a brokerage account, the trades can be automatically executed for you. So if you have sold your business and you've say you've got a few hundred grand or a million or two, you can say, okay, well, I'm just going to go put this over here and I'm going to have this strategy just actively invest. I wouldn't say active trade, I'd just say actively invest and manage that. Uh, and it runs hands free. I mean, if you want to get in and learn to trade, you can actually like have my strategy traded and also get the newsletter that comes with it and learn and feel the experience and the videos. And as you become more comfortable and learn how the markets work, you can start to maybe try and do some on your own. But, um, you know, it is very difficult to crack into this space, especially the markets we're in. We're in what I call a stage three topping phase. We've been in it for about uh, two years already. Uh, sectors are all over the place. They're good one week. They fall out of bed the next. The markets are in a bullish phase. Then they're in a bearish phase and they're back again. I mean, they're all over the place. So this is definitely one of the hardest times for somebody to crack into this space if you don't know what you're doing. And if we have a market correction, it is a very different way that needs the markets need to be traded to make money. It is People just were like, oh, I'll just buy an inverse ETF. But trust me, the <laughs> making money from falling prices is a very different game. It happens very quickly. Different rules and strategies have to be deployed. Um, right. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to crack into the space, I would say have it done for you from somebody that knows what it's doing, but follow along, learn. And when you feel like you've got a good grasp of it, then, you know, you could start to trade some of your own capital. But I mean, I, as much as I hate to say it, I'd be like, don't get, don't really get into, into wanting to trade full time because you're going to realize it's kind of not that fun once you're, you're in over your head and you're down big money and you've dug yourself a huge hole and you're looking up going, Oh man, you know? Yeah. I, I think it's honest advice. I mean, I think that you're right about the market and where we are right now. It, they, the, the experts, the experts don't even understand the labor market right now. For, for the most part, they don't even understand why people haven't come back to work after 
after COVID happened. I mean, there were some guesses. They've they've sent out some, you know, they've done some qualitative research on, you know, quality of life for a certain for certain folks and and uh, and why they've decided that they want to pursue the type of work environment that they're in right now. But you know, not you know, every market right now has there, there's so many things. This this is probably one of the most complex markets in history yeah. at the moment because you have wars going on right now in the Middle East. You have the bond market that is topsy turvy. You have like you got the so internet, it, the internet influencer bubble. Everybody wants to stay home and be their own influencer. I'm not going to work. <laughs> yeah, you have the. That's exactly right. You have the the social media influencers that are that are all pumping something, and oh by the way, they're being paid to pump something that they're pumping. Yeah. So how do you filter that information? And then of course you have obviously the government has pumped in the U.S. government. Uh, and I'm sure in Canada too, they've pumped in trillions of dollars into through, throughout COVID and like, it, you know, for the last three years. And so that has an effect on, there's only a certain, you know, what, what's the old saying that you can only split a do, $1 a certain amount of ways, right? So that has effect on everything, how businesses work, um, what money is available for things like certain programs, um, like social programs in the country, things like that. But um it, you're right. Like it's hard. It's hard for a person to come in and actually to to make a definable strategy because without a certain level of expertise, if you're trying to break in right now. So, I mean, I think I think it's a good point about them, perhaps aligning themselves with someone like like you or TechnicalTraders.com, um, who have who have spent, um, in your case, 25 years or more, um, like assessing the markets and understand nuance and complex strategies let me let me ask you this so you say that investors have stockholm strategy i mean stockholm syndrome um when it comes to volatility and returns and so if you're watching this and you're not exactly sure what stockholm stockholm syndrome is it's basically when a, <laughs> when a hostage falls in love with a captor um so what do you what do you mean by this yeah yeah so the financial industry has has made almost most products all the marketing everything that advisors are taught and told to say and, and all that stuff they they more or less make most people feel like you can't time the markets and that you just need to buy and hold and just have a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds and to me that is a very bad strategy if you have a bunch of assets some of them are going to do very very well others are going to do really poorly and then when you net them out, you get this really crappy average return of like four to eight percent a year. Plus, mm -hmm. you've got drawdowns of almost 40 plus percent, if not more in a lot of cases. So it's a volatile ride with crappy returns. And so investors naturally will be like, well, I don't think we should time the markets. It sounds risky. And so they stick with their advisor doing what I think is bad, which is the buy and hold. And then they take things even a step further. They go and they tell their advisor or they just if they're managing their own money, they're like, well, I like. Apple or I like whatever company it is, I'm going to buy some of this individual stock. And now what they're doing is they put all these little companies that they like in there. And so now they've just diversified more. And because they bought a bunch of single individual stocks, which are very volatile, when the stock market does have a correction, their portfolio goes falls even further because they're holding now a whole bunch of individual, very volatile assets. So you know, the problem is they just don't realize by adding more stocks, especially individual stocks, they're actually doing more damage to their portfolio and they're just falling deeper into this diversified um, uh, strategy feeling. And they, they believe that they're doing the right thing. But I think anybody who's, you know, got lots of bonds in their portfolio is probably looking back if they've got an advisor and they haven't done anything over the past two years. I mean, they've people got to be scratching their head going like, why the heck am I holding bonds if we're in a rising you know, interest rate environment? Like, I mean, a financial advisor should be the first thing they should be worried about is like, what do we do with our bond position? They're, they're better to just, you know, collect interest on the sidelines and ride bonds down 45 to 50%. Um, so, you know, I, that I just believe that investors are just kind of lulled into this strategy of just, well, I'll just keep diversifying. I'll buy more stocks and I should be okay. But, they're really just digging a deeper hole. <laughs> and then when, uh, when all else fails, buy and hold. So if you're watching yeah. this live and you have a question for Chris, go ahead and put your question in the chat or in the comment section, and I will bring it up and he'll, he'll be able to answer it. Um, feel free to, feel free to chime in. Don't be scared. And 
get your question. And if you have any questions about anything he said or um, just a comment that you want to make, it's absolutely fine. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so while we're waiting for some comments or some people to ask questions, if, if they have them, um, tell me about the four stages of investor emotions. That sounds pretty fascinating. Um, yeah. So there's, yeah. So I mean, not, not to, not to try to throw a pitch here, but if they go to my website and they join my free newsletter, they can download this infographic. It'll come in an email. So there's four stages that the stock market goes and, through. And what we'll do, I'll just stop you real quick is we'll put the link to that infographic in the chat as well. Perfect. So, I mean, sorry, in the description to the video, so yeah. they'll be able to grab it. Yeah. All right. So long story short, this infographic has got three blocks to it. The top block is there's four stages that the market goes through. Uh, the second one is the emotional side, which is uh, the roller coaster ride. And then, of course, the bottom one is talking about cycles. So we go from kind of price action to emotional to cycles. Uh, very different each. And, and this is one thing that a lot of people don't bring into their trading or investing is they just kind of trade off emotions or potentially just price action. But you have to bring in not only price, but you got to factor in sentiment, emotions. Right. You've got to factor in cycle uh, cycles where money's flowing. But Long story short is uh, stage one is a basing stage. This is where the market is just trading flat or sideways. Uh, people are kind of just, you know, not interested in the market at this time. It's it's a time when you just want to avoid the stock market. A stage two is a is a markup stage. It's when the stock market is rallying. It's a bull market. Everybody loves it. Uh, a stage three is what I believe the stock markets are in now in 2023. It's a topping phase. Markets are choppy. Assets are all popping and dropping all over the place. Things are struggling. And then a stage four is a decline, a financial reset, like 2008, like the 20, uh, the 2000 tech bubble. So, you know, what, what's coming around the corner could be pretty gnarly and it will be, it could be a huge financial reset. So understanding what stage we're in tells you how to attack the markets. What assets should you be focusing on? How active should you be? Should you even be in that asset if it's you know, is it in a stage three or stage one? You might not really want to be that active at that moment and move on to something different. Um, so that's kind of those those stages. Now, the other uh, section of that is the emotional side, which if you're a technical trader, you get to live this emotional side, the good side of this wave twice, which is more or less as the market is is coming out of a stage one and it starts to go up, people start to have hope. They have some belief. They think, OK, well, the markets are going up. Um, they start to get a little excited, they invest in, and as the markets kind of go up, uh, they start to have belief because they're making money, price is going up, but eventually the market comes to an end. We have this like euphoric blow off phase where everybody's making money. They all think they're heroes. And, uh, that's when a lot of people who haven't got into the market yet pile in. And that's what creates this huge pop in price. We saw this, you know, right at the end of 2020, uh, the first month or two of 2021, every the whole world just kind of gave in like i have to get into the stock market not only are we locked up at home but it's the only game in town uh, right. and it created this huge pop and and then eventually it's going to have a big break and and break down it and then create a, what i consider um it, it's a a kind of a pause in the market and mm -hmm. it's kind of trading sideways or higher a complacency stage and that's what stage three is. That's what we're in. A lot of advisors are saying the market has revalued. We had a bear market last year. You know, this is the start of something new, which I think is as far from the truth as what's going to happen as possible. Uh, and so investors are getting, they're mentally firming up. They're mentally thinking that the markets are going to start another five or 10 year bull market. And advisors are, are funneling the cattle like in, in for this new ride. And then what's going to happen here is if the market breaks down, people start to well, hold on. Are you really seeing investors that are pouring their soul into the fact that they think this is a bull market that's just not slowing down? I I think the market it is eventually going to roll over. Real. <laughs> I, I think I think the stock. I mean, this this year has been an amazing bull market uh, yep. for stocks. Although it's just a, re a retracement. I mean, we're we're not making new highs. It's just a rebound rally at this point. Right. Um, the, the play has been to the, the upside this year, but I do think it's going to come to an end and it's going to roll over and crash. And then investors are going to start to get anxiety when we break the 2022 lows. They're yep. going to have anxiety and they're going to be like, there's no way this is another bull market. We just had one, you know, last year or, or in 2022. They're like, I can't afford another one. And then the market just keeps falling. And then they're like, they're in denial because price is falling so fast. 
and then suddenly they're they're panicking because they'll be like, oh my gosh, I'm down so much, I cannot believe this is happening. And eventually they hit a, a panic level where they're like, at the rate my accounts are falling, I'm going to be broke in you know a few more months. And then people eventually get out of the market, uh, mm -hmm. complete fear. And then it just the market you'll eventually find a bottom, but they will have panicked out at the bottom. So it's a very difficult ride. I mean, in, in 2008 to 2009, a one year window, there was uh, 6,500 people committed suicide from falling equity prices directly wow. linked to it. So it is a very serious thing that we're coming into. And um, I've seen how financial crisis, uh, financial loss can, can devastate a family and, and people's health. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you were a technical trader, as the markets are breaking down and people get anxiety, as a technical trader, we're, we're actually reliving the, the bullish wave. We're actually like, oh, this is exciting. This might be the start of a stage four because we can profit from falling markets. Sure. And uh, markets fall about four to seven times faster than they rise, meaning we can make four to seven times more money in, in one year than we would over like a four to seven year bull market. So there's a huge opportunity here. So we start to drool and we get excited when the markets are starting to break down. As people are panicking, we're already in and we're we're making money. And eventually, as they're literally giving up and, and exiting the markets and getting depressed and hating life and hating the markets, we're actually just like, you know, it's like taking candy from a baby where the markets are moving and free falling and we're profiting from it and we get to take what's, advantage of it. So it it's a very famous, different. What's the famous line? Be be uh, fearful when everyone is greedy and be greedy when everyone is fearful. Right. Like just to put exactly. it in perspective. Yeah. So it's it's a, an emotional roller coaster ride. And like to take it a step further, if you look at the stock market cycles, uh, you look at the economic cycles, um, you know, we've been seeing crude oil and energy do very well over the past two years. Oil put in a huge high last year. It's uh, been one of the strongest sectors this year. Uh, gold is still holding up near all time highs. These are the two last assets, the two last commodities that do that hold their value the best just before a stage four decline. Uh, obviously, we got interest rates, uh, rates hiked uh, through the roof, the fastest uh, pace I'm sorry, ever. The, the commodities were, you said gold? Gold and oil. Gold and oil. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just I just did a um, I, I did an interview with David Garofalo of the gold of the gold royalty company. Um, right. They, they invest in um, in in uh, gold mining, gold mines, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. And, um, you know, he was talking about how the how gold has you know stood the test of time of all these markets the bears, the bulls, all of it across the board for years. And it's just mm -hmm. that stable force. And, um, you know, obviously he is in the camp where he thinks that people dismissing gold in the face of, you know, currency being uh, the value of currency going down. Um, they're making a huge mistake as a result of it. So, um, I mean, it was an interesting interview. People watching here can go back and watch that the interview. I thought it was, I thought it was uh, really telling um, how he felt about it, but, um, uh, oil, of course, is you know there's there's a reason why countries go to war over oil, um, because yeah. you know I think despite the uh, the prevailing kind of environmental issues pe people have with oil, I think that the I think at the end of the day, if we're being honest, people know that oil is not going anywhere. Yeah. So and it's in a stable. Yeah. Um, well, I'm I'm a gold bug. I mean, I'm I'm a huge. I'm surrounded in precious metals. I have it everywhere. I have these like new gold bills that I give away to people. Oh, it's nice. like one hundredth of an ounce gold bills. I mean, I love the precious metal space. In fact, I'm I'm known as the golden oil guy. <laughs> that that's oh. what I'm known as the golden oil guy dot com. <laughs> that's where I really started because the thing is, you know, gold and oil kind of haven't, you know, they fall in and out of favor. And uh, there's going to be an amazing time for precious metals just around the corner. I still think there's going to be a bit of a rough road for another quarter or two, but the precious metal space is going to be absolutely unbelievable. I made a lot of money in the last major uh, precious metals rally after 2008 crisis, even in the 2000. So we're talking huge potential. And I talk about all this stuff, what I do every, every week in my newsletters too, because I'm huge into real estate, huge into precious metals. And of course I'm all about using ETFs to manage our, our, our main uh, investment accounts to do it in a conservative way. But uh uh, yeah, it's a, it's another asset class that people are going to want to be involved in. And um, 
I mean, we're really just starting a, about a five to 10 year super cycle in the commodity space and mostly in precious metals. So it's going to yeah. be pretty exciting. Yeah, it's cool. So Jonesing Finance chimes in. He says, dollar cost average and chill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I like physical. Like I, I don't look at gold so much as a play to to make money. If we get into another major super cycle for the gold in the precious metal space, I'll be moving into like some gold miners, like little individual stocks, because yeah. they rally hundreds to thousands of percent. But when it comes to physical gold, just exactly what Matthew said, I like to accumulate physical metal, gold and silver. I always mm. I never buy coins or anything with some extra premium on it. I just give me blocks of gold and silver. I don't I don't need any fancy coins. Um, I just want the weight yep. and do the same sure. thing. I buy some every year. I stockpile it. It's an insurance plan that if you know things go crazy, I'd like to have some physical asset. Because guess what? We had the internet go down in Canada. Um, right. It was, I, don't know, I think it was last year now already. I don't know. Time flies. Ever since COVID, I, I lose track of that, the years. Mm -hmm. But um, we had the internet go down. Rogers, they pretty much cover all of Canada. And I had to go in town to do my morning video for, for subscribers. And I, I go into another place that has a different internet. And this guy is like, hey, Chris, he goes, you don't know who I am. He's, he's a, uh, some fund manager. So we sat down and chatted and he's like, you won't believe what I did. And he knows me from pr the precious metal space. And uh, he says, he pulls out the silver rounds. He goes, I just filled up my car with gas because the internet's down at like all the gas stations. I filled my car up with some silver rounds. They took my silver at spot price. Get and he out. Goes, it just goes to show if like, you know, <laughs> things go to hell, you can just pull out a coin and be like, I need some food. I need some fuel. Yeah. Uh, so it, it still it comes into so play true. within hours. You can use it. Things become the book of Eli when everything goes to crap, right? Remember the most valuable yeah. possession in the book of Eli was the Bible, right? And then everyone was right. fighting for that because they knew it had a chance to control the masses. But like in this case, you're talking about the little, a little golden, <laughs> a golden coin yeah. that you can give to someone. So we have yeah. a, a question from uh, Matthew Rosewood, um, Roswood, who says, uh, any thoughts of turning your strategy into an ETF? Oh, I get that all the time. I got advisors that want to do it, manage it. I, I don't want to get into... I like freedom of speech. I like running a newsletter. I like trading my money. But as soon as I get into managing money, it's like the handcuffs come on in terms of you can't say this, you can't do that. Um, someday it might go into an ETF, but I like to enjoy life. I don't want to be like, I don't want to actually like enter the financial space and all the BS that goes with it. I don't want to feel like I'm one of, I'm in that space. I'm trying to stay part of it. I'm against the financial space. I just want to make money for, for myself and for everyone else to just follow along and, and, and pull money out of the market from all the other people who are on the wrong side. Yeah. Right. You just want to use it for your needs. It is, it is, it's so funny because like, you know, so I, uh, my company before I sold it was, um, a part of it was franchising and, um, you know, you're regulated by the FTC and essentially you're selling securities when you're selling a franchise and you're right. Like, it's hard. It's like you can describe what you do. You can describe all this stuff, but then you're so confined about mm -hmm. how you can talk about your business and yeah. how you can even talk about business strategy. Because if you're, if what you say influences someone to, to buy your, buy your company and then they lose it, it's like, you you're yeah. so constrained by, um, you know, what you can and cannot say and what you can and cannot divulge. It's, it's limiting. You don't feel free. You can't just be a pig and get the money and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I just don't like rules. I've always been independent. I mean, everything I do is very independent. Uh, like all the sports I do, like kiteboarding and fishing and surfing or whatever it is. I mean, I've, I've, I've just always been an independent person because uh, I'm also spur of the moment. I, you know, click of a switch, I'll, I'll just go and do something that I, I feel like I want to do. Um, so I'm not one for like rules and being kind of funneled in and saying, do this, you have to do this. You can't do that. Like, I just like to be an entrepreneur. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> Yeah, that freedom, that freedom uh, is, it's, it's, it's quite, it's quite, you know, it, it's, it just kind of fills you with gas, man. It fills you with fuel being able to, it, it you know, does on your own terms. The, yeah. The problem with, uh, unfortunately, the entrepreneur space, while I believe it's the best way to go, I absolutely love it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. The problem is most people create a business. It's actually not a business. They just create a job, right? That's right. And the best thing you could do would be to like this, you know, built to sell this little book. It changed my whole life instantly. I'm like, okay, how do I systemize this? People run and do all, all the stuff. Things run without me, which is absolutely amazing. And um, if you can just find a way to get yourself out of it so that you just have to kind of oversee, 
you know, some basic levels and keep things going. I mean, it's, it's so amazing that feeling. And then it's, it becomes an asset itself because now you can actually, you know, if you want to, you can sell the business. Like, I mean, I started a healthcare business. I built a dealer network uh, across Canada, United States. I got it, you know, some of the products on as seen on TV. And, you know, I saw the 2008 financial crisis coming. I was big right. into the markets then. And I, I, I was with my dad. I said, dad, I don't want to be in this business anymore. Let's sell it. Mm -hmm. And we sold our business because I could see dark clouds coming on the horizon. I'm like, we sell it now and we can walk away. And we sold our business because we had it systemized. We had a dealer network. Phone calls would just come in with like, we need another two saunas. We need these products shipped. We need right. these. And, and so if you, if an entrepreneur can just find a way to systemize and replace themselves, you might not make as much per year, but you're also not a slave to your business. And at any point that business can be sold uh, if you wanted to and take that capital and, and build another business, another machine and um, trade up and, and keep doing things. like I that. swear we did not plan this because what I'm about to say <laughs> is, is um, I guess mildly self-serving, but I built a whole university. I, I, I can't believe I'm, I'm talking about this now because I haven't even done a formal launch of it yet, but I built what's <laughs> called common sense university and the whole school is designed to get business, small business owners to assetize their business, I call it, turning their business into an asset by teaching them how to like create systems and processes to put in place, how to right. do that, how to take a goal setting framework and their brand promise and their mission and values and turn that all into how they can deliver their system. And um, there will be a link to that as well in the description, even though I'm not ready to launch it. You can get a pre-launch version of the co of access to the Common Sense University um, yeah. in the description, but it's it's, it is true. I there's a, there's a hole in the marketplace for this kind of education. There are plenty of books, but there's no real there's no real implementation uh, programs out there. And so I'm building a small business implementation program. I've built it, and um, I'm going to continue to add to it. I'm I'm excited about it. That's cool. You sound like an ENTJ. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I am an ENTJ. It's yeah. true. We yeah. we want to kind of uh, remake the world. Um, so we have another. <laughs> Another uh, question from uh, Benoit Desrokers. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. He said, Chris, can you please share your thoughts on crypto, more specifically Bitcoin, medium and long term? Uh, I don't really tap into this space because I, I ended up getting going on a Bitcoin. Yes, I will answer those. But little story short is I got one of my social media guy. This was a couple of years ago. He's like, you got to go on this Bitcoin show. I, he goes, I know the guy. I'll get you on it. And it was the only show I've ever gone on that I've never watched before to see. Literally, he threw it at me so fast. He's like, you just got to go. You're on it. And I had no idea what I was walking into. And I can't remember the name of it. It's one of the biggest crypt crypto channels. Anyways, I got in. It was like a round table. And my analysis was, it was trading up in the 50s. And I said, oh, I showed my charts. I said, all my analysis is pointing to about $16,000 Bitcoin. And I could barely even explain all the stuff because they were laughing at me and, and throwing comments at me. Like they were just roasting me, right? It wait, was, wait, what year was this? Uh, I don't know. It was a few years ago. Unbelievable. Okay. Go Anyways, ahead. so they, they roasted me. and I, I just put on my blinders and I just kept on trudging through my stuff, just letting the bullets just ricochet off me. And in my head, I'm just boiling because... Um, just like your your show, the common sense. I'm like these people have no common sense. <laughs> <laughs> like there's technicals here. There's right. there's all kinds of yeah. stuff showing the trends changing, and it's pointing the momentum's pointing to this price. And anyway, long story short is uh, it ended up falling and collapsing and hitting those levels. But uh, I ever since then I'm like I don't even want to deal with the, the Bitcoin space. But um, I don't know where Bitcoin's going to so go. It, it collapsed, and then did you go back on the show to say I told you so? You know what? I've looked up their station a couple of times because I wanted to, to go back, but I'm not, I'm an INTJ. I'm an introvert. I don't need to go uh, make waves. I'll just live my life over e, here. That's they, the INTJ way. So here's, yeah, here's yeah. what I would have done. We have a problem. We have a problem. Ladies and gentlemen, we have problems. Oh yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's not me. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So anyways, no, I haven't done that. I don't, I don't need to do that. I like to live in my own quiet bubble, do my own thing. And yeah. Share help wherever I can with people who are fun and happy. So that's, that's my, that's my thing right now. But I think Bitcoin back to, um, Bennett's question here was, uh, 
Bitcoin, ever since it got into the futures market, even before that, it, it started to connect more with whatever the stock market is doing. If the stock market tide is going down, it's been pulling down. Uh, if the stock market rallies, it rallies. It's definitely still a different asset class. It's not 100% correlated and it can be correlated, not. So it's a lot like the precious metal space. And I, I talked about this recently is how uh, precious metals in a stage three topping phase can sometimes act as a defensive play. They can actually be one of the strongest assets just before the stock market collapses. And Bitcoin, I've seen that happen many times too. It comes as like a defensive play. People are worried about uh, falling stock prices, worried about the currencies. So they move to Bitcoin. So it is really difficult to tell if Bitcoin is going to move with the stock market or against it. I do think it's going to have its time to shine. I think when, if we have this financial reset, I do think precious metals uh, in, in crypto, Bitcoin more specifically, I think are going to just probably skyrocket again. Um, but I don't really think, I don't think we're there yet. I still think we're another quarter or three quarters away um, in terms of, you know, months, maybe nine months away from maybe the market having a big flush out and correction and, and precious metals and Bitcoin will probably be a couple of the first asset classes to take off. That's what we've seen in the past. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it happens again. So um, I, I do this time around, I'd like to get more involved in them. I only own a little bit of Bitcoin. And I don't have any more, but um, I think when the next major value play comes in, when there's a reset, and I think things have a good value for a long-term buy and hold for a portion of some capital, I'll buy into some Bitcoin and play that trend until I think it's coming to an end. Do you think that um, the, I don't want to say the myth of of crypto, like it, it like it's not real, it doesn't exist, and it's not beneficial, but the reputation of, of, Bit, of crypto precedes itself for many people and they blindly just invest with these aspirations of it only moving in one direction. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people think that and do that and they're, they're, they're buying a lot of ticket. I mean, that's what most people are buying crypto for. They're buying it for like, oh, if I put a hundred bucks in, it might be worth five grand later or, or they're putting in whatever they put in. I think a lot of people see it as just a, a a lotto play. I'd much rather go buy, take your mulatto money and go throw it into Bitcoin. At least it's got some resale value. <laughs> but uh, well. I, I think a lot of people do see it going up because that whole space has been groomed. It's manipulated. It's a, I, I don't like to do work in areas that are, that definitely don't have rules and have a lot of shady people and everybody's trying to brainwash just to keep buying and buying and hold. Um, it can create opportunities for sure, but I just, it's not a space that I'm comfortable in and I know there's huge opportunity there, but I only invest in stuff that I like, that I believe in, that I know really well. And honestly, I had such, for some reason, I have a very sour taste with crypto. And so I've just never really even stepped towards it. I, I, I bought some, I held it, sold it, and I, I have no interest in it. So um, maybe the next go around when I think there's a fair value, I, I might go back and, and get involved, but uh, I just had a bad experience and I just <laughs> I don't yeah. want, don't deal with it. <laughs> it's kind of hard to shake those bad experiences for sure. It um, is. So tell us about your book, Asset Revesting. Sure. So Asset Revesting, it, um, you know, as I was mentioning before, it's not active trading. It's not passive buy and hold. It's kind of right in the middle. It's, um, you know, a strategy that is, I, I would call active investing. We're just playing the waves in the markets using technical analysis. We move through an asset hierarchy. So U.S. equities like the stock indexes is our top most volatile asset. Uh, and then we go down to bonds, we go down to the dollar index and we go to a, a cash interest earning type of position. And so we just reinvest our capital and jump around those assets. So if the stock market is moving down, we move to something else that's moving up. And so our account is just, I call the strategy CGS, which stands for the consistent growth strategy. So even when the market's falling, we can move somewhere and watch our account keep going up. And, and that's what people really like is because we're just almost, you know, every quarter, our accounts just keep hitting new all time highs, no matter what the market does. And that's when people, especially people with the auto trading option where they don't have to do anything, they can just log into their account. And they're, some of them are like, I'm scared to log into my account because the market's been going down. And then they log in, they're like, oh my gosh, our account just hit a new all-time high. They're like, I don't get it. Keep me in this. This is amazing. Like, I don't know what's going on, but this defies gravity, right? So right. that's what asset revesting is all about. It's about not holding things going down. If we don't like anything, we, we sit on the sidelines and we can go live life. Uh, the nice thing, the COVID crash, 
not only did we profit from the 20% rally in bonds during that, but then we sat in cash during the complete chaos. So we could actually focus on our lives, our health, uh, everything that was going on. Like, I mean, that was some new, some new times, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that I don't know if we'll ever experience again, or maybe in our lifetime, I'm not sure, but it was pretty scary. And what was amazing was not only did we make a fortune during the first couple of weeks of that crash, but then we just had all of our money sitting on the sidelines and we could just focus on our health and getting toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Toilet paper was the, the bond class of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> COVID. I, yeah. I remember I had my uncle um, ship me up some toilet paper from North Carolina because he's a, he's a, he works for a sprinkler uh, fitting company down there and they just had come across some kind of um, boxes of toilet paper. And I was like, man, maybe I should flip these on, on eBay and makes it makes some, <laughs> make some money off yeah. these things. Right. Yeah. Um, there, like was, the there was, there was, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. They're like the big commercial size ones too. Like, so they don't even fit on anything in my bathroom. They're just massive for no reason, but that's exactly what I was going to say. I have a friend who bought these massive rolls. <laughs> it's like probably like five miles of toilet paper. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. It was the only thing available. She got a few cases of them and she's like, do you need them? I'm like, I don't, I mean, I don't even know what I'm going to do with that. Like, like, <laughs> it was like she like, actually sold them on eBay. Did she really? Yep. It made probably made a lot of money. Like the, um, you know, it was like wiping your butt with 120 grit sandpaper. So yeah, exactly. it, it was, it was not fun. <laughs> um, so Chris, um, any, uh, any final words about how, um, again, individuals who are watching this and kind of has it have enjoyed, you know, the conversation today, what should they do tomorrow to get started? What's your suggestion? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you like reading, I, I wrote the asset revesting book, it's only like 120 pages. There's a bunch of charts in there. So it's a very quick, quick read. I really, there's, it, there's no fluff. I just cover the reality of the markets. Um, understanding the four stages, the emotional side to me is one of the most important things and, and, and your personality type. If you need something done for you, if you need a lot of guidance, or if you can do it on your own, you need to know where you stand in there. Um, yeah, if you, if you want to learn the style of investing that I do, so we're, we're just constantly moving from one asset class. Like we only hold one ETF at a time, one position. We're only in one asset, which is why I say we don't diversify when it comes to the stock market. Rather long stocks, rather long the dollar or the inverse dollar or bonds, um, which is really nice. I mean, it seems so simple. And, um, you know, to me, it makes common sense, which is what I love about your podcast, the, you know, the common sense show. It's like, so many people just don't have common sense and, and, and people unfortunately buy and, and take action with emotions. They don't use common sense or logic. I can say something that makes to me common is common sense and it has really good logic. The numbers work, yet everybody wants to go and do this. It's super active, aggressive and do all this stuff. Um, so I, I would just, you know, if you're interested, you can go to my website, which is thetechnicaltraders.com. And uh, if you join the free newsletter there, you'll get the infographic um, that uh, we'll, we'll probably link uh, in the description below here. And uh, you can download that and see these these things I'm talking about and uh, go from there. Yeah, so here's here's your website right here. Um, so go check out his website, thetechnicaltraders.com, and you'll be able to experience financial freedom and get uh, definitely get his newsletter. Um, right at the top here, watch the videos, all the, get the information and get asset revesting. So, uh, Chris, what I would like to do is I think I would like to have you on, um, the show again, um, sure. because I want to like, it's always nice to make predictions and then kind of take a look back at them and see what happens. So I want to take kind of what we talked about today and then now fast forward this, um, after some time to see kind of what, what we talked about today and, and what was the result of this, um, Mm -hmm. you know, moving forward. So I, right, listen, I, I really do appreciate your time and uh, your attention to detail with how you, and the strategy that you came up with. Now that I know that you're an INTJ, I absolutely don't even doubt how much time you spent thinking about this <laughs> and putting together the strategy for it, because that's all you guys do, um, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, is living in your head. So I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. I appreciate it, Micah. No problem. All right, so uh, that was Chris, Chris from technicaltraders.com, Chris from Moulin, and uh, it was a great show today. Um, I appreciate him stopping by and uh, him sharing his, his trading advice and his trading strategy with you. 
Um, don't forget, if you haven't already and you're watching this stream, go to my YouTube channel, find the Common Sense Show, since spelled like dollars and, and subscribe. Um, one of the things that we do on this show is we teach not just strategies about investing like in, in this asset class, but turning your business, if you're a small business owner, into an asset class of its own so that you can, as Chris mentioned in our interview, so that you can actually take time away, avoid burnout, and uh, be able to build a business that actually works and makes money and can sell for multiples if you want to sell it. So um, don't forget to join my uh, my newsletter, which will be linked in the description, um, which gives you access to weekly insights about business strategy and operational strategies as well. And of course, take a look at my Common Sense University, which I'm launching, small business education platform, which includes um, so much information about how you can actually turn your business into an income producing asset so that, you know, you can have that and pursue other interests that you might have as well. So I appreciate you watching today and looking forward to the next interview, live interview, which is coming up in about uh, a week or so. So thank you for tuning in and I will talk to you all later. See you later. Bye. This is where I play the outro, which I can't seem to find right now. Oh, there it is. See you later.